Well, hello. Happy Father's Day. Thanks so much for joining us today. My name's Josh, if we haven't had the chance to meet yet. And uh, man, I, I think while women may have the superpower of multitasking, my wife included, men perhaps have the superpower of tunnel vision. Yeah. <laughs> Mike says yes. Uh, this next song we're gonna, or this first song we're gonna sing, I love how it zeroes that tunnel vision in on asking God to be our vision, to be our focus. And so would you stand with us and let's worship God together. Let's sing to him now. As we uh, continue in worship together, uh, one of the most known verses of the Bible, uh, John 3.16, talks about God giving us his son as a loving father. And so we, uh, we have a video for you. You guys can take a seat for a moment and uh, take a look. And uh, as we get ready to sing a new song, just let this stir your heart.
For God so loved the world, all of us, you and me. He loved us so much he sent his only son, Jesus. The firstborn of creation, sent to take our place, to bear our burden, to suffer our consequence. We were far from God, but God didn't want to be far from us. Jesus came to bring us home. As a prodigal returns to their father, so too could we return to our Creator. A simple plan with just one requirement. Belief. For whosoever believes in Him will not perish, but will have life. Life eternal. At the very heart of God is love. Indescribable, unrelenting, unstoppable love. That love shines a light guiding us home. For God so loved the world. Would you stand again? And we want to sing of God's love for us. Let's celebrate that he invites us into that and jump in when you get the hang of this new song. Come all you weary, come all you thirsty, come to the well that never runs dry. Drink of the water, come and thirst no more. Come all you sinners, come find his mercy, come to the table, he will satisfy. Taste of his goodness, find what you're looking for. For God so loved the world that he gave us, his one and only son to save us. Whoever believes in him will live Come lay them down at the foot of the cross Jesus is waiting there With open arms See His open arms For God so loved the world that He gave us His one and only Son to save us Whoever believes in Him
his one and only son to save for God so loved the world that he gave us his one and only son to save us whoever believes in him will live forever the power of hell forever defeated now it is well I'm walking in freedom for God so loved God so loved the world bring all your failures bring your addictions come lay them down at the foot of the cross jesus is waiting god so loved the world the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide the ransom for my life oh he is my son you are good you're good oh you are good you're good oh the king of my heart be the wind inside my sails the anchor in the waves oh he is my song let the king
God, we thank you for your goodness. Lord, that's hard to sing sometimes when we're going through a hard time that you'll never let us down. But truly, Lord, whether, whether we have plenty or we have want, Lord, you say in your word that you're enough and that you are with us no matter what, that you'll never forsake us even to the end of the age. And because you're with us, through the hard times, Lord, we can get through it with hope, with you. So Lord, wherever we're coming from today, Lord, uh, for the men and the women in the room, Lord, focus our attention, our tunnel vision, our singular focus on you today, to know you more, to follow you, not just with our words that we sang on the screens, but to follow you with our life, to worship you with our life as a way of saying, thank you, Lord, for all you've done for us. So, Lord, we give you ourselves in this time. We want to hear from you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, thanks so much for singing. Before you have a seat, could you just say hello to those around you before you find it? Well, good morning, Southwest Community Church. It is great to have you with us this morning as, uh, as we celebrate God's goodness and open up his word. Right now, I'm asking the ushers to come on down and pass out the registers. We use the registers to get to know you. If this is your first time here, your second, third, or your 300th time here, we don't care, but we would love you to fill out that register. Take a moment. Let us know who you are. That's the top half, but the really, really, really important stuff is the bottom half. Because you see, there's an opportunity for a prayer request there, and we love to pray at Southwest Community Church. And so please let us know how in this next week we can be walking alongside of you and that we can be praying for you. So take a moment, fill it out, let us know who you are and what we can be praying for. Right now, I'm gonna invite Chris and Kelly Cole up. They have been some of our global workers in Thailand most recently, but they are transitioning. And so we wanna honor them and we wanna honor all of you here at Southwest Community Church for your involvement in their lives and walking alongside of them. So we celebrate. Chris and Kelly, and thank you for taking a moment to share with us. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. That's better. Uh, it's a bit overwhelming looking out in just uh, some of the faces we see this morning. It's really good to be here. Um, not all of you know us. We are Chris and Kelly Cole, former staff missionaries of Southern Gables for over 20 years. And now I know the name has changed, and so I'm going to try not to refer to Southern Gables the rest of this time. Um, but this church, this is our first time back in Denver since the summer of 2020 when God led us off uh, the mission field. And I took a position at John Brown University in Arkansas. So we are so glad 
this morning to be able to, in person, say a huge thank you to you and also to thank God for his blessing to us through you for so many years. My relationship actually began with uh, this church back in 1979 when I moved with my family from Africa to Denver and started my freshman year of high school and my family started attending this church. First person I met at this church was Mike Springer, by the way. Um, nine years later, Kelly and I were married in 1988 in Lamar, Colorado. And quite a few families from this church came to our wedding, standing beside us as we started our lives. Shortly after that, our three children came along, Jessica, Cameron, and Corey. And I think we'll have a picture of them coming up here. Um, they were all born here in Denver. And they were all, there we go, they were all dedicated in this church. Some of you were at those dedications and committed to partner with us in praying for them and in helping us to raise them in the way of the Lord. And as we started off our young families in this church, we needed that community. We needed the body of Christ walking alongside us. And you did that. And then we were appointed as missionaries in the late 90s from this church and spent 20 years in Turkey and Thailand as an extension of you in partnership with you, teaching and mentoring, discipling the children of missionary families so that they would stay in ministry serving God in some of the most unreached areas of Asia. I vividly remember our commissioning service here at this church. There was a consensus from this church body affirming God's call and his calling in our lives and telling us to remember when things got difficult that God had called us and that this church was behind us, praying for us, loving us, caring for us. And he did for 20 years. For 20 years, this church did. And we're just so full of gratitude to God. Whenever we think of this church and of how through you, Christ has ministered to our family for so many years. Thank you. We are, we are no longer missionaries of this church but we continue to strive together for the glory of Christ and for the gospel alongside of you. And let us rejoice in some of the results of your faithful partnership with us over these years. In Turkey, in Ankara, Turkey, there continues to be a very strong school called Oasis, which is meeting the needs of missionaries in Turkey. And there's a stabilized growing school in Chiang Mai, Thailand, Grace International School, which has gone through many challenges the past 10 years, but God has helped guide it to be healthy and serving to meet the needs of over 350 families serving in Asia. And God has grown our family over the years. And there's a picture. Yeah. Um, each of our three children has married godly spouses and they're raising their families to love God and to love others and to faithfully follow Christ. And we believe in, in no small part due to the prayers of many sitting in this room. And so again, we just say we love this church body. Thank you. Um, we want to ink. Uh, thank you, but we also want to encourage you. Um, we've heard that a lot of people are leaving the churches and isolating themselves. And this story, our story is that God has ministered to us through the body of Christ and that God calls us to be in community because we need one another. And that's where we continue to grow. 
and even at our age, starting over in Arkansas has been a challenge in that way of getting plugged in. And so we just want to encourage you to continue to go to church and be in community with each other. Thank you. Thank you very much. Your work continues at John Brown University. We need uh, strong Christ followers in the university setting, so keep up the good work. A couple quick announcements. This is a church that has a pulse, okay, with a lot of activities going on, so you're going to have to pay close attention here. Here's what's happening in the upcoming week. Number one, next Sunday, a week from today, we will have our annual meeting, and at that annual meeting, that'll be at, during the community hour, from 10, at starting at 10 o'clock, and during that time, we'll take a look at God's faithfulness and celebrate his faithfulness in the past, take a look at what he's doing now and celebrating that, and taking a look at what we think he's going to do in the future. He has shown his faithfulness in the past. He's shown his faithfulness now. We have no doubt that he will continue to be faithful to us in the future. So we're going to affirm the 2022-2023 budget, and we'll also have a lead pastor update. And so we think it's very, very important for you to be there. So that'll be next week during the community hour at 10 o'clock. Also, right after that then, for lunch, we will be uh, hearing from a couple of our global workers. The Guderians will be here as well as the Thompsons. And so we invite you to join us for lunch. You can sign up for that via the, the weekly newsletter that you get on Thursdays at 6.01 p.m., and, uh, and so look for that, and you can sign up through that link as well. Then, on Wednesday of this week, this coming Wednesday, I, I'm, well, let me push the pause button a minute. Any of you watch a hockey game last night? Yeah? Okay, a few of you. All right. Well, you know what? The fourth and final game will be held on Wednesday <laughs> at 6 p.m., and we're going to host a watch party right here. What a great way to invite your neighbors and friends and family to a very non-threatening event. Okay, we'll have some snacks available and uh, I plan on bringing my grandson, my seven-year-old grandson. So I invite you to come join us for the watch party for the fourth and final game of the Stanley Cup final. Okay, now you guys know what's happening at 6 p.m. In the first service, I said 6 a.m. Won't they be surprised when they show up at 6 a.m. and they're 12 hours early, okay? Then finally, back to the lead pastor search. We've given you an opportunity. We want to hear from you, and we want to hear what your values are. So there is a link online, again, through the weekly newsletter, the Thursday newsletter. But there's also a hard copy if you want to share what your values are and what you see as important in that lead pastor position at the Welcome Center. In the uh, Welcome Tables in the Welcome Center is an opportunity for you to pick up a hard copy of that survey fill it out, get it back to them, or find a staff member, and, uh, and we will pass that on to the search committee. Okay, please join me in prayer. Father God, we just come today, better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere, so we celebrate this moment where we're at right now. And Lord, we look forward to having your word opened up. Lord, speak to us as only you can do, Move us as only you can do. Change us as only you can do. So, Lord, we, we, we thank you for Chris and for Kelly and their work that they have done, but their work continues at John Brown University. So we just bless them out and pray your hand over them and, and their ministry as it just continues in a different place because we do ministry wherever you place us. And so, Lord, we pray our richest blessing over them, and we just thank them for the work that they have done. And now, Lord, as your word is going to be opened to us, I pray for, for, for Scott and his words to us, that they're not his words at all. They're your words. They're your thoughts. May the words of his mouth and the meditations of his heart be pleasing to you because they are your words. And may we walk out of here different than when we walked in. Have your way in our hearts, Lord, we pray. And all God's people said, amen. amen.
Can you uh, join me in giving Scott Winnig a hand and welcoming him? He is the Applied Theology Professor at Denver Seminary. Welcome, Scott. Thanks, Mark. Uh, it's nice to know that you have the gift of prophecy related to the Avs. So uh, ho hopefully that will come true, yes. Hey, so good to be with all of you here today. Uh, some of you I don't know. Some of you I've known for many, many years. So good to see you again. Uh, my wife, Melanie, has joined me here this morning, and you're going to want to come up and talk to her because she's clearly the best of this couple. So... Um, Normally, what I do um, when I preach is I read the passage that we're going to look at, and then I pray. Uh, but this morning, I'd like to flip-flop that, so I'm going to do a brief prayer, and then we're going to go into the text out of Matthew chapter 15, and then we'll walk our way through this story. So let me pray for us quickly, then we'll read the passage together. Father, thanks for the dads here. Thanks for the moms here. Thanks for the kids and everybody else. Lord, we just thank you for your love that you have for each and every one of us. Lord, we thank you for your word. May you now make it clear to us and encourage us and challenge us. And we ask this in the great name of Jesus and for our sake. Amen. Matthew 15, starting in verse... 21. The apostle says, leaving that place, Jesus withdrew to the region of Tyre and Sidon. A Canaanite woman from that vicinity came to him crying out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is suffering terribly from demon possession. Jesus did not answer a word. So his disciples came to him and urged him, Send her away, for she keeps crying out after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. The woman came and knelt before him. Lord, help me, she said. He replied, it's not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Yes, Lord, she said, but even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered, woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted. And her daughter was healed from that very hour. Uh, does anybody here beside me think that Jesus seems to be a little bit rude to this woman? Maybe a little bit misogynistic, perhaps even a little a bit of racism here, maybe even a little bit of mean? I've got to tell you that for years, whenever I read this particular episode in the life of Jesus, it really bothered me because it seemed to be so inconsistent with other facets of his life and the way he normally responded to other people, even really, really sinful people, people like tax collectors and prostitutes. But over the last couple of years, I've been helped in my study of this text by some great scholars and teachers such as Ken Bailey and John Ortberg and Dale Bruner. And now this passage has become one of my all-time favorite stories about Jesus and his encounters with various people. Let me try to explain what's going on in this passage and why I like it so much. Uh, as you all know, Jesus was the master teacher, and as a teacher, he knew that sometimes you lecture, and sometimes you model, and sometimes you give your students experiences to help them grow. And Jesus was an expert at what some educators called deliberately induced frustration. Uh, for example, he would tell his disciples to feed a huge crowd of people when they had no food, knowing that 
they couldn't do that. Or on other occasions, he would send them in boats across the Sea of Galilee, knowing a huge storm was on the way, knowing they didn't have the ability to navigate through that storm. Or he'd tell them to cast a demon out of someone, knowing they didn't have the spiritual power to do that. Jesus regularly used deliberately induced frustration to probe his disciples, find out where they were on the spiritual growth chart. Now, that's part of what he's doing here in this text, but that's not all that he's doing here. As you know, teachers also like to give tests on a consistent basis, and Jesus did that as well. A moment ago, I mentioned Ken Bailey, who was one of the greatest New Testament scholars of the past generation. And Bailey says that in order for you and me to understand the point of this encounter between Jesus and this Canaanite woman, we've got to understand that he's testing two sets of people. First, he's testing the woman. But secondly, he's also testing the disciples. Now, as we walk our way through the story, we're going to see that the test that the woman gets is different than the test that the disciples get. So as we walk together through this episode, what we want to try to determine is who aces their test and who gets an incomplete. We want to see who passes and who fails. And most important of all, we want to see what these tests have to teach you and me as the followers of Jesus in the 21st century. Now, to discern all that, we have to first of all understand the background to this encounter. This episode takes place in the region of Tyre and Sidon, which were two Phoenician cities way to the northwest of Israel on the Mediterranean coast. The Jews absolutely despised and hated the people who lived up there. Josephus, the first century Jewish historian who lived about the same time as Jesus, said, the people of Tyre and Sidon are our bitterest enemies. Well, that's how many Israelis feel about Palestinians today. But to try to help us to understand how the Jews regarded the people of this region, we need only to remember Jesus' words of judgment in Matthew eleven twenty. There he warned the Jewish people in the cities of Capernaum, Chorazin, and Bethsaida that if the miracles he had done in their cities had been performed up there with those Canaanite Gentiles in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented in sackcloth and ashes. What he was telling the Jews of those cities was even the most wicked people you know the bottom of the spiritual and moral barrel. People who sacrificed their children to the fires of their gods and their goddesses, those people would have repented if they had seen what I had done. The point is, is that the disciples, as good young Jewish men, they would have regarded this woman as an enemy. They would have viewed her as a member of the most spiritually degraded, morally reprobate group of people that they knew. Her people were, in their eyes, the worst of the worst of the worst. And so to them, she's a complete outcast. But friends, notice how she approaches Jesus. In verse 22, she comes with the traditional cry of a beggar, have mercy on me. And then she adds the title Lord to her petition. Now, while that word Lord could mean sir or master as well as Lord in the divine sense, the fact is is that she uses that title two more times in this story. And she calls Jesus the son of David. Well, that's a messianic term. 
So it's clear that she knows something about Judaism. She's incredibly humble. She's deeply respectful. She's willing to cross some ethnic and gender boundaries that simply were not crossed in her day or time. Now look again at verse 23. Jesus did not answer a word. I mean, her daughter is suffering terribly. And she appeals to Jesus with humility and reverence and intelligence. He acts like he doesn't hear. He responds with silence. He responds with what appears to be indifference. Maybe even rejection. And you know, you just know that had to feel really, really bad to her. Friends, let's please notice that Matthew doesn't try to hide this. I mean, he was part of this group over here. He was one of those 12 disciples. He's observing this. And he deliberately draws attention to it here in this text because he wants you and me as the reader to grapple with what Jesus is up to here. Jesus is giving a test, and tests are not always pleasant to those who are getting tested. A long time ago, in what now feels like a galaxy far, far away, I entered the PhD program in the history department at CU in Boulder. And once I got into the program, I realized that the faculty was filled with a lot of smarty pants people who got their PhDs from Ivy League schools like Harvard and Yale and Princeton. Well, the faculty department at CU, I think they kind of had, uh, had an inferiority complex. They, they felt like nobody really valued them. So they implemented what I later called uh, kind of academic Darwinism. And that is, they were trying to always weed out all their graduate students so that they would only be left with the best of the best of the best, and then they could kind of enhance their academic reputation nationally and brag about all their graduate students. Well, once I got into the program, I realized there were three parts to getting the degree. The first was your coursework, which was 30 semester hours. The second part were your comprehensive exams. And then the third part was doing your dissertation. Well, after I finished my coursework, I had to get ready for my comprehensive exams. And these were four exams, and they were given on four days, and they were each four hours long. So I started to get ready, and a couple of months before my exams were coming up, I asked a fellow grad student who was really smart, really hard worker, who had just taken her exams the semester ahead of me, I said, Joan, how were comprehensive exams? She said it was like combat. I thought, great. So I really buckled down. I really studied. And then I took those exams, a Wednesday, a Friday, a Monday, a Wednesday. And if you failed those exams, you only had one re redo, and then they kicked you out of the program. And then they made you wait about 10 days to get the answer. Well, after 10 days, I got the answer, and by the grace of God, and I mean that, I passed. Now, I'm much more of a Presbyterian than a Pentecostal, but when I got the word that I passed, I almost spoke in tongues. <laughs> Jesus is giving this Canaanite woman a spiritual, comprehensive exam. And she's got a decision to make in the face of his silence. How deeply do I want healing for my little girl? How far am I willing to go to get her help? How much can I trust this Jewish rabbi? But we also need to know, friends, that as Jesus is giving her a test... He's also testing the disciples. See, they're not at all surprised by his silence 
in the face of her request because no self-respecting Jewish rabbi would have talked to a woman, let alone a pagan woman from Tyre and Sidon. I mean, they were all really familiar with the ancient rabbinic saying, he that talks with womankind brings evil on himself, neglects the study of the law, and at last will inherit Gehenna, which is hell. So the disciples are not at all taken back that Jesus seems to ignore her. But friends, what they don't get is he's also testing them. Do they understand the heart he has for everyone? Do they understand what he's really, really about? Well, verse 23 notes that they respond pretty strongly. Send her away, for she keeps crying out after us. John Ortberg makes the wonderful insight in his exposition of this text that their response here is pretty grandiose. I mean, she hasn't said anything to them. She comes to Jesus. But they very generously include themselves in Jesus' power, in Jesus' ministry. She's bothering us. They always need us. Everybody wants a piece of us. Send her away from us, Jesus. I mean, they're the disciples. They're the ones in the know. They're the ones who are connected to him. They're the inner circle. See, they want to put a wall up around Jesus and keep everybody else out. Human beings are pretty good about building walls, aren't we? And I'm not talking about border walls to separate one country from another. I'm talking about relational walls. In the back seat of crowded cars, in fact, some of you might have experienced this this morning on your way to church, siblings say to each other, you better not cross this line or I'll tell mom. Walls sometimes get built between husbands and wives. Walls sometimes get built between people who work together. Certainly walls get built between races and cultures and nations. I mean, all you and I have to do is turn on the evening news and we can see that. So friend, let me ask you this individually, and please know, I say this with all sincerity, please know I'm asking myself this as well. Are we building walls against other people or are we inviting them into relationship with us? Let me ask you this as Southwest Community Church. Are you building walls in the church body here? Or are you building relationships, especially, especially with new people who walk in through those doors? See, as we look at this story here in Matthew chapter 15, it's pretty clear that there's a huge wall between this Canaanite pagan woman and these 12 self-important disciples. And so what Jesus does is he goes on to implement part two of his test to both the disciples and the woman. Look at verse 24. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. Now, you know, whenever I read that, I always asked the question, why would Jesus say this? I mean, on so many other occasions in both word and deed, it's clear that he's not willing for any to perish. He's come to minister to everyone. I mean, in fact, at one point, Jesus said that many would come from east and west and they would sit down and dine at table with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of God. And east and west is code for Gentiles. So why, why does Jesus say this now when in fact later on he responds to the woman's request? 
he's giving the disciples an experiential test. See, he could lecture them about the value of every human being and he could remind them about the necessity that when somebody comes to you with a need, especially if they're hurting, you meet the need. But friends, in this case, he wants them to see this woman's pain. He wants them to learn to empathize with her struggle. He wants them to hear the cries of her little girl. And so that even though here in verse 24, it sounds like he agrees with the disciples, please note this crucial fact. He doesn't send her away. See, he wants to know if any of the disciples will stand up and say, hey, Jesus, you know that sermon you like to preach all the time? It's kind of your stump speech. Well, you remember that part in that sermon where you're always telling everybody, including us, that we're to love our enemies? Jesus, what about that sermon? Or he wants to know if one of them will stand up and say, Jesus, I know she's a pagan. I know she's a Canaanite. I know she's a Gentile, but she's really hurting. Can't you hurt her or help her? Or maybe he's wondering if one of them will stand up and say, Jesus, her little girl is in incredible agony, and you've got the gift of healing. Couldn't you just one more time go over and touch her and heal her? See, Jesus wants to know, do any of you guys have the guts to stand up for this woman and her little girl? Back in 2003, I was invited along with 20 of my co-citizens in the city and county of Denver to serve on the grand jury panel B for the whole year. And so every other Wednesday, 20 of us gathered at the city and county building downtown, and we went down into the basement, and we went into this back room, and there we assisted the district attorney's office of Denver with the investigation and then the prosecution of all kinds of criminal activity. And we investigated and prosecuted all kinds of things, all the way from petty theft to gang murders. But early on, within the first couple of months, there was one case we investigated that just broke my heart. It just wrecked me. It was this little two-year-old girl, Alizé Rygard, and she was beaten to death over the course of about a year by her mother and her stepfather. Well, there was a cousin that reported this to the DA's office, and so what the DA's office did was they brought in all kinds of different people, family members, friends, neighbors, and they sat them down in the witness chair and they cross-examined them and asked them if they ever saw or heard anything at all. And every single one of those people, except for the cousin that reported the death, lied through their teeth. They said they didn't see or hear a doggone thing. No one would stand up for that little baby And at this point, at this point, the disciples won't stand up for this woman and her daughter. And friends, we need to know that at the exact same time that Jesus is testing his guys, he's also making the woman go through part two of her test. She just heard Jesus say, Hey, you're an outsider, I'm the son of David. I was sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. You're not on my mission. You're not part of my strategic plan. You're not on my list of goals and objectives and people to be ministered to this year. So why should I serve you? Once again, here's her test question. Is her concern for her daughter so deep? Her conviction about Jesus' compassion and power so strong that she will persevere in her petition even when it seems like he's unwilling? Oh, friends, notice what she does, verse 25. She comes and kneels before him and she utters a single phrase from deep down in her heart, Lord, 
Lord, please help me. Now remember, 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 the disciples are right here. They're watching this whole thing play out in front of them. And the tension begins to build within them. Because their theology, what they've been taught since they were good little Jewish boys in the synagogue, is that this woman is to be shunned, she's to be ignored, she's to be turned away. And yet you got to think that there was something inside of them that starts to get touched, that starts to get moved. I mean, this is the desperate cry of a mom for her little girl who's in deep emotional, spiritual, and physical agony. Could it be? Could it be that God is bigger than the theology they were taught when they were growing up? So what Jesus does is he leans in, pushes hard into part two of their test. He gives voice to the theology that they were taught. Look at verse 26. It's not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Well, the meaning of this verse couldn't be any clearer. The children were the Israelites, the Jews, the disciples. The dogs were Gentile Canaanites like this woman. In the ancient Near East, dogs were despised animals. They were scavengers and garbage eaters and considered almost as unclean as pigs. That's not true in our culture, though, is it? (laughs) This is what we do with dogs in our culture. We anthropomize them. I mean, just the other day, I was driving home from work on Bellevue over here, and it was one of those beautiful days. It was probably 85 degrees. And this guy pulls up to me in his convertible Corvette. Yeah, I was a little jealous, I'll tell the truth here, okay? But I mean, he was cool, he was looking groovy. I mean, it's a great day. I'm thinking, yeah, you'd want to be out in your convertible Corvette. And riding shotgun was his dog. But in the ancient Jewish village, the ancient Jewish synagogue, the ancient Jewish home. There's no room for dogs. In effect, what Jesus is doing is he's saying to the disciples, you want me to get rid of her? You want me to limit my ministry to Israel? Okay, we can do that. I can do that. And then you can watch her agony. And you can hear the screams of her daughter because you think They're just dogs. See, Jesus is using some pretty harsh language here about dogs to force his guys to face themselves, to give reality to what they've really been thinking and feeling privately. See, you know this and so do I. It's one thing to talk about somebody behind their back. You've all done that and so have I. It's a totally different thing to tell somebody to their face exactly what you think of them, especially if what you think of them is rather ugly and they happen to be a person in need. Jesus is giving the disciples the relationship test. He wants to know, gentlemen, Will any of you stand up for her? Will any of you reach out to her? Will any of you love her? And the answer is no. None of them will. And this is the end of their test. They're going to get incomplete on their report card today. Now, there's going to be other tests coming down the road, and down the road, they'll do better. They're still learning, just like you're still learning and I'm still learning. But today, they didn't do too well. Friends, Jesus is giving some of us in this room this morning the exact same test he gave the disciples. It's the relationship test. There's somebody in our lives that we're having a really hard time loving 
really hard time offering genuine Christ-like compassion to her. Maybe it's a coworker, or maybe it's a child. Maybe it's even a spouse. Or maybe, maybe, maybe like the disciples, it's a whole group of people that you have problems with, like gay people or African-American people or poor people. See, Jesus gives all of us the relationship test on a pretty regular basis, and he wants us to pass it by reaching out to people, caring for people, and showing them love. That's the will of God. That's the heart of his kingdom. That's the way of Christ. He wants us to get an A on the relationship test by showing people love. But Jesus is also looking for followers who can pass another test, and this takes us back to the woman. I mean, in verse 26, when Jesus talks about giving children's bread to dogs, there's something very interesting we see only in the original text. In the Greek text of this text, there are two words that could be used for dogs, And it's significant that Jesus chooses the softer diminutive word here, meaning little doggy or little puppy. I mean, he's not talking about attack dogs like Dobermans or Rottweilers. He's talking about vulnerable little pups. He does that for her sake. And now she faces the hardest part of her exam. Will she run away? Will she give up? Will she insult Jesus back? Or is her love for her daughter so deep, her trust in Jesus so strong, her compassion so intense that she won't give up? Her response is incredible. Look again at verse 27. Yes, Lord, she said, but even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. I mean, for the third time she speaks to him, and for the third time she calls him Lord. Even without getting what she wants, he's still her Lord. And it really helps to understand the tone and the flavor of her response here, because actually it's pretty amazing. She picks up on Jesus' use of the word doggy or puppy, and then she adds that same emphasis to the word crumbs. In the original text, her response literally reads, Yes, Lord, but even the little dogettes get the little crumettes from their master's table. I mean, she comes back at Jesus with some grit and some grace, even a little bit of wit. It's almost like there's a little bit of uh, playfulness here. She's like she's verbally sparring with Jesus. Oh, yeah, Jesus, I know you got to give the kids the, the, the food, but there's still some crumbs left over for my daughter and me. She's just not going to quit. My wife Melanie has a cousin by the name of Lauren, and she and her husband Rob are good friends of ours, and we get together with them throughout the year. And a few years ago, Rob and Lauren decided to do an Ironman competition. Now, some of you in here may have done this, but when I heard about this, it almost made me comatose. The first part of the Ironman competition is you've got to ride a bike 50 miles. Then as soon as you're done with that, you've got to swim five miles. And then as soon as you're done with that, you've got to run a marathon of 26 miles. And you have to do this within a certain period of time, within a certain day. So Rob and Lauren trained, and the day of the Ironman competition came, and Rob did pretty well. He finished with about five hours to go, but Lauren really, really struggled. In fact, when she got into the last few miles of the marathon, she was completely exhausted. And she told us it was literally one foot in front of the other, and she was running out of time, but she kept going and going, and she finished with about two minutes to go. That's what this Canaanite woman in the story is like, she just won't quit. Friends, that's the endurance test. See, the disciples faced the relationship test. The woman faced the endurance test. 
And some of you here right now today are facing this exact same test. Something's going on in your life. It's really, really difficult. And you just don't know if it's ever going to end. But it's not just that. It's also when you pray, when you kneel, when you beg. You don't understand God's response or his lack of response. He seems silent. He seems indifferent. In all honesty, it feels like he's treating you rudely. And the question is, will you keep the faith? Will you grow in faith? Will you pass the endurance test with your faith? I'm a church history nerd, and there are a lot of people in the history of the church that I have a lot of admiration for. One of those at the top of my list was the great 18th century revivalist and evangelist John Wesley. Uh, Wesley's revivalism changed England in the 18th century, and he eventually became the founder unintentionally of the Methodist denomination. And we look back at him as a great Christian, very faithful, who God really used to make a huge impact for the kingdom. And all that's right and true. But in his own day, in his own time, in his own culture, Wesley was often hated and faced the endurance test. Listen to just one entry from his journal. Sunday, May 6th, I preached at St. Lawrence's in the morning and afterwards at St. Catherine Cree's Church. I was enabled to speak strong words at both and was informed that I was not to preach in either of those churches ever again. Sunday, May 13th, I preached in the morning at St. Anne's Alderdate and in the afternoon at Savoy Chapel. I preached free salvation by the blood of Christ. I was quickly apprised that I am to preach in neither of those churches either. Sunday, May 20th, I preached at St. John's Wapping at 3 and St. Bennett's Wharf in the evening. At these churches, likewise, I am to preach no more. Sunday, May 27th, I preached at St. Antholin's in the morning and was told never to return. In the evening, I preached at Bath in a field but was chased out by a bull let loose by an angry farmer. Sunday, June 3rd, in the morning I preached near St. Isaac's but was accosted and challenged by a man named Nash who told me my preaching violated an act of parliament. Sunday, June 10th, I declared to about 10,000 in Moorfields what they must do to be saved. I again insisted on that foundation of our hope, believe in the Lord Jesus and thou shalt be saved. Hundreds were touched by the grace of God and prayed to receive the Savior. Friends, some of you in here are facing the endurance test this morning, and I suggest that all of us in here at some point will face it in the future. So the question is, will we keep going in faith when we don't know how or when we're going to get relief? Even when we can't get the answers we want and we can't make the pain go away, will we still bow before Jesus and say, Lord, you're my Lord even when your ways are not clear and don't make sense? You know, this Canaanite woman in this story not only amazed Jesus, But at this point, she blew the disciples away in terms of spiritual commitment. I mean, they've never encountered anybody who showed such confidence in the Lord or demonstrated such all-out, pedal-to-the-metal, risk-taking faith. I mean, when she approached Jesus, they thought that they were looking at their inferior, the spiritual bottom of the barrel, a dog that they'd never let into their fellowship. But it turns out she's relating to Jesus on a level of humility, reverence, and faith that at this point they can't achieve. And so Jesus looks her in the eye. The mask comes off. The test is over and now it's time for the grade to be given out. Verse 28, 
Woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted. And her daughter was healed from that very hour. Well, as many of you know here, the word for great comes from the Greek word mega. We use it for phrases like mega stars and mega churches and mega malls. She had mega faith. This poor, pagan, Canaanite woman who the disciples thought was the bottom of the spiritual barrel. She's honored and praised by the one before whom she knelt and called Lord and who she would not let go of. She got an A plus on the endurance exam. So friends, let me ask us, are you getting the relationship test today? Then respond to love. Are you getting the endurance test today? Then hang on through thick and thin and respond with mega faith. Listen, listen, listen. The tests are going to come. They will come. They're going to come to you. They're going to come to me. And so when those tests come, let's reach out in love. Let's reach up in faith. Let me pray for us, and then our wonderful worship team is going to come back up and lead us in a great song. Let's bow together. Father, it's only by your grace and the power of your spirit that we can obey you and do what you called us to do. Help us to rely on you 100%, to trust in your spirit, and to plead for your power as we seek to live in faith and live in love. Thank you for this day in this church, Lord. May you bless this church in our day together. In Jesus' name, amen. I already plugged it in. Great. Uh, let's stand. And man, what a great message from Scott. Thank you so much for bringing us the word. We appreciate you. As we worship a God who has uh, gone so far beyond our expectations of how he would treat us, it says that while we are still sinners, Christ died for us. And uh, there's a few steps that I think are just lost on us sometimes, that God chases after us. And sometimes we forget if we've been a Christian for a long time, uh, it's easy to forget that God is still pursuing us and he's still chasing us down to show us who he is and, and that he loves us no matter how we think we're undeserving. So let's, let's sing of his love and worship him now.
When I was your fool, still you love fought for me. You have been so, so good to me. When I felt no worth, you paid it all for me. You have been so, so God, we praise you that you run and chase after us. Lord, unless we're of Israel and Jewish, Lord, that's our common experience that because of this passage, you show your heart to those far from you. And so God, we praise you. We ask you to remind us of your presence with us as we go. Remind us of your love throughout the week. Lord, thanks for dads everywhere. Thank you for my dad. And each of us have a story. And thank you, Lord, that you're the perfect father for us. Help us to trust you more, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks so much for joining us today. And I uh, hope to see you next week.